Good evening, everyone. Let's just make sure everything is working good. All right, here we go. All right, let me make sure we are all good to go here. Can you guys hear me? Would you be so kind as to write in the little question and answer thing to just let me know that you can hear me and you can see this face? And then we will get started. I am so excited. Okay, awesome. Oh my gosh, you guys. How utterly exciting is this? I am so thrilled to be with you this afternoon from North Carolina. We are having quite the tropical storm pass through. I am directly connected to my internet, so I really don't think that we will have any problems. But if we do, we are problem solvers together and we will figure this out. I want to personally welcome every single one of you into this recovery group. This has been a long time in the making and I am truly honored that you would let me into your stroke recovery. For those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, I just wanted to tell you a couple things. You do have control over uh, my face here and in a minute, I'm gonna switch over to my PowerPoint slides. You can move me around, um, you can change the size of me. And as we're going through the lecture today, I wanna to encourage you to save your questions for the end only because the lecture kind of builds on itself. And by the time we get to the end, we're gonna leave a nice chunk of time for interacting and getting questions answered. I want to encourage you as we start this stroke recovery journey together to make this time special. To me, the reason I have done this is because I feel very strongly that there has been a gap in your recovery if you are the typical stroke survivor and thriver. What I mean by this is that I don't believe you have gotten enough education and enough true genuine validation and support to make the very best recovery that you can. I think many of you are desperate for this information, especially from your doctors, but the way the healthcare system is set up right now, it just doesn't go along with this insurance-based model that we have. So to me, this is a necessary part of your recovery. So I want you to make it special. I want this time from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, to be a time of uh, relaxation and respite. So every time that we meet, what I would encourage you to do is, you know, get ready ahead of time by getting yourself all comfy in a nice chair, uh, get yourself a cup of tea, get a nice glass of water with some lemon. I want you to really try to sink into this information. Because I'm about to give you a ton of information, what we're gonna do is record this and make it available to you after. So that way, as you're listening to me today, you don't have to try to hang on my every word. You're gonna have this PowerPoint slide, this recording as a reference to go back and check out later, okay? We're gonna send that to you within 24 hours of being done today. Also, as I go through the lecture, we're gonna talk about handouts that we're also gonna send you to really bring this information to life. So again, you don't really have to try to keep it all in your mind as I'm talking. I want you to just be able to sit back, relax, and listen to what I have to say this afternoon. Okay, so the first thing is some of you know me, but some of you don't, okay? I am your guide on this stroke recovery journey. My name is Dr. Karen Sullivan. I have an unusual background for a neuropsychologist. I'm not kind of your typical uh, going through the educational system, coming out on the other side in a perfect package as a doctor. I had a unique start. I dropped out of high school in ninth grade in order to become a caregiver for people with dementia. And this was really born, uh, really two people really inspired this. The first one was my great grandmother. She had Alzheimer's disease, but also there was a man in my neighborhood named Ed who had multiple strokes and his daughter knew me and asked me to stay with him for a while. And we went on an amazing recovery journey together all the way from grilled cheese and coffee ice cream sodas at the diner to learning how to do math again, to helping him learn how to cook again. And it was an absolutely wonderful relationship. And those people that I took care of in those beginning parts of my career are always with me in my heart and always guide me to be a practical down to earth doctor who I hope really gets what it's like to live with brain health conditions. So this is kind of the first part of my career, working in assisted living facilities, being a therapeutic companion and activity 
activities director. These were awesome years of my life. Then I was very lucky to have people that believed in me as a high school dropout, no, no grades, no SATs, and was able to get into the PhD program for clinical psychology at Boston University. Oh my God, was that really 10 years ago? I then finished my internship and my fellowship at the Boston VA through Harvard Medical School and am a board certified neuropsychologist and a licensed psychologist. Uh, I first got down to North Carolina, where I live now, by working at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in the inpatient rehab unit, specifically on the stroke unit. So any of you who have been through an intense hospitalization and have gone into inpatient rehab, you hopefully have interacted with a neuropsychologist. I worked in that system for a little while, but unfortunately realized that I could really fulfill my vision of comprehensive and truly progressive brain health care on my own. I really needed to have my own place. So I opened up my own private practice almost seven years ago. Again, amazingly, uh, time flies. And then about two years ago, I kind of decided to take what I do in my practice to a much more national and global level because I really believe that neuropsychology and the information that we share through education and empowerment is a key part of your healing and not nearly enough people have access to a neuropsychologist. So my idea is to bring you my style of brain health and brain recovery directly to you at home. And we've been on Facebook doing a weekly free lecture for about that time, about two years. So newsflash, everyone, I think you will agree with me. We radically need to improve post-stroke care. What we are doing, I can only speak in the United States right now, is simply not enough. And frankly, I don't think it's humane. And I think that it is a, a, a big responsibility on people like me to take more time and make more effort with the people we care for that have had strokes. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen nearly enough. So folks who've had strokes, and you guys can tell me if I'm right, report really high satisfaction when you're in a stroke center, when you are in a rehab center. Here's the problem, and here's what I kept hearing from my patients year after year. Once you go home, once you are discharged, people continuously tell me it's like falling off a cliff. It's like being thrown to the wolves. You know, you had structure in the hospital and the rehab. People told you what to do. People supported you. You had cheerleaders. It was all set up for you. Then you get turned loose at home and it's like the wild west. Very hard to know exactly what it is you're supposed to do. Uh, within an instant, spouses become caregivers. Within an instant, you maybe went from a uh, you know, a scientist, all of a sudden now you are a patient. There are radical identity shifts that happen overnight, and we don't do nearly enough of a good job in helping people make that transition. The more severe your post-stroke disability is, the more unmet needs you are going to have in your recovery and in your rehabilitation. And the reason we are here is because all of these unmet needs radically exacerbate anxiety because you simply don't know what to do. And I think that that is inexcusable because the information is out there in the scientific literature, in your doctor's heads. It's just they do not have enough time, whatever that means. They don't have enough, whether or not that's an administrative issue or whatever the case may be. But to me, information heals. And that's what we're going to do in this 10-week journey together. So almost 80% of people who have had a stroke report that they have significant unmet needs in two areas, education and support. And to me, these two things go hand in hand. I do not believe you can feel supported in a stroke recovery unless people understand as well as they can as an outsider. Now they'll never get it, what it's like to be you and to live in your brain. But if people understand better, I believe that you can get more true support, more genuine compassion and more help. Education is such a cornerstone for me of stroke recovery. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen in my practice who don't know where they had their stroke, don't know why they had their stroke, don't really understand the full spectrum of their stroke symptoms. And that is the focus of our first session tonight. It is a cruel myth that brain healing only happens for a few years following a stroke. How many of you have heard that? One year, maybe two years. That is old school. We do not believe that anymore. What we now know, and this is 100% true, is recovery after a stroke is a lifelong, never-ending process. 
but it's not a process that happens spontaneously. It is a process that is determined by what you do in your post-stroke care. Now, the reason I wrote my interactive stroke recovery guide, the reason we're doing this virtual stroke recovery group is because I couldn't find anything out there that fit the bill for post-stroke care including the very most important three things. Now, the first one is that we have to use science. This can't just be uh, opinions. This has to be based on scientific soundness. We need evidence-based strategies, but not just for healing of brain. What you are gonna hear me say time after time in our group together is that we also have to bring the psychological trauma to the table. One of my beliefs is that we medicalize strokes and stroke recovery much too much. And what I mean by that is we focus a lot on the physical, we focused a lot on what can be seen, and we focus a lot on things like MRIs and medications. And absolutely those things are important, but guess what? If we gave our people, our patients, more expertise and respected what they had to say more, I truly believe that as doctors, we would know so much more about the psychological trauma that comes along with stroke. And the reason this is so important is if we don't validate and heal the psychological trauma that you have been through, and we just focus on brain, 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 you're going to miss a whole opportunity for helping brain. We are not brain alone, correct, right? You are a person first, and then you have a brain. I hope we all agree on that. If we don't bring person into this equation, Asian, we're missing the boat. The next one is we have to personalize stroke care. What might work for you is not necessarily going to work for your spouse or your brother or your next door neighbor. It's very important that you make this recovery personal to you with recovery goals that are unique, uh, be able to track your progress and stay motivated with a focused and positive attitude. Again, to me, these are psychological needs in post-stroke care. The third one is empowerment tools. If you think that you can just leave this recovery up to the doctors, there's no way. You guys know this, right? This is why caregivers become these unbelievably tenacious advocates because if someone is not taking the lead on your stroke recovery and you just leave it up to the medical system, I'm sorry to tell you, but they don't want the job. You have to accept that job. That is 100% your full-time job now, is how can I become a respectful, assertive advocate for the things that I need to push my recovery along? So the big question I asked myself two years ago is, who is telling people what to do and how to recover both psychology and brain at the same time? And it really, really hit me that I felt a strong responsibility to do it better. Now, I'm not in control of Medicare. I'm not in control of Social Security disability. But what I can control is being with you right here, right now, and sharing all of the information that is in here. And what my solution was, was to write the I Care for Your Brain Interactive Stroke Guide. And what we're going to do for the next 10 weeks is basically bring this guide to life. Now, why did I want to do it this way? Well. Some people after a stroke, reading is not necessarily the best way they're gonna learn. Some people, of course, have difficulty with language and reading. Other people are much more visual learners. They are better with auditory learning. But really the real reason I'm here is actually kind of a, a, a gift from this COVID and the quarantine is I actually have more time in my schedule now to be able to work on these slides with my assistant Carrie, my partner Carrie, and really um, make it something that kind of jumps off the page and come to life, which I'm super excited about. So as uh, you learn with us, what you're going to see is at the heart of this group and at this guide are what we call the 10 rules of rehab. And I need to tell you how those came about. To find these rules, I literally spent over a year going through decades and decades of the highest quality research that I could find, animal models, human models, uh, bringing in technology to really distill the concepts that were most important for stroke recovery. And what I came up with, I was lucky, it was an even number of 10. But the idea is as long as you know these rules, you can apply what we're gonna teach here to any stroke symptom. I don't care whether it's post-stroke aphasia, post-stroke depression, whether or not you can't use your hand, if you have a visual field issue, um, if you are having difficulty um, with planning and organization. These are the rules of rehab, of neuroplasticity, that the 
we're all scientists who study stroke. They all know this stuff. But here's my beef with academia, is that this information doesn't trickle down to the people who would actually benefit from it the most. And so the way I kind of look at myself is I'm kind of an interpreter. A lot of this stuff is not my original work. I'm simply taking it from one uh, culture, which is the scientific world, which likes to speak in very, you know, fancy terms that are pretty inaccessible to most of us. And I kind of take it through this filter and I spit it back out in a way that I think is easy to understand and actionable. And what I mean by that is that the information I'm going to share with you, the whole point is that you actually use it. Yes, it is intellectually interesting. Yes, I hope that you will be entertained by our time together. But what I care about most is that you actually put it into practice. And of course, I'm gonna tell you how to do that. So the next 10 sessions are going over these 10 rules, one rule per session. Tonight, we are gonna start with make your map, which is, they're kind of all my favorite because they're all very essential, but I really love make your map because there's a great role here for neuropsychology. As we go through every week, every Thursday together, we're gonna to go through this rule for an hour and a half for each one. So you can go through those, you can pick the ones that you feel like best apply to you. You can decide what you think after you spend some time with me tonight. You can come to them all. Of course, if you do them all, you're really getting the full, full, full package. And to me, that really is what you deserve in this recovery. So once you start to understand these 10 rules, I think you're really going to feel a sense of calmness and a sense of empowerment because you're not going to have to wonder anymore what exactly is it I'm supposed to do to have the very best recovery possible. You're really going to feel like you know what to do and you're in control. And again, that is such a piece of this for me is if you don't know what to do, you are naturally going to feel anxious and overwhelmed. And guess what? Those are the two complete wrong mindsets to have in any type of a neurological recovery. It just doesn't work that way. You have to be informed, you have to be empowered, and you have to have instruction, okay? So here's the catch though. How do I come up with 10 rules of rehab, but also make it personal, right? So because every single brain is different, every stroke is gonna be different, every stroke recovery is going to be different. Brain health, has to be personalized to be the most effective. So to do that, what we have done is to develop these interactive worksheets that are going to help you personalize the knowledge I'm gonna teach you, how to apply it to your specific stroke symptom, how to process your unique stroke trauma. Again, if every stroke is different, some people have more trauma in their story than others. Some people don't necessarily feel um, that they were personally victimized by the stroke. A lot of people do. So we have to try to figure out how to apply it to you. And really the goal is to guide you towards that personal recovery. So within about 24 hours when I'm done tonight, we're gonna to be sending you a copy of this recording and emailing you these handouts, these interactive worksheets that are gonna teach you how to put all of this into play. So I just wanna quickly go through what is this group exactly? Well, it really comes down to three things. At the end of the day, I just want to empower you with knowledge and information. This can be as personal and interactive as is comfortable for you. Sharing at the end when we open up Q&A is completely up to you. You can tell me as much as you want. You can clam it. You can, you can not share. Totally up to you, whatever your comfort zone is. But I do also have to tell you, this is not a traditional support group. Um, it's not necessarily um, a time of sharing a full story of what you've been through. We just have too many people and too little time, unfortunately. It's also not personalized medical care. All decisions that you make about your recovery really need to be between you and your trusted professionals. However, what I really wanna encourage you to be is that knowledgeable advocate who goes to the professionals and works with them in partnership to make personal decisions about your medical care. So as we get started on this recovery journey, I have a initial question for you, and this is going to guide you through all 10 sessions. This question is, what is your why? Why are you here with me tonight? Why do you want to go on this recovery journey? This is such a critical question. This is your motivation. This is the reason that you're here, okay? I want you to think right now of the top two reasons that you want to do better, get better, feel better. 
for a few different areas, yourself, your family, your friends, your community. And the truth is you really, I think we all have a responsibility to be our best selves for the world. The world needs content, peaceful, joyful, fulfilled, uh, loving people, right? We, we see a lot of that not happening right now in the world. I personally feel a responsibility every day to try to be my best self. And I want you to really get in touch with what those motivations are for you. And the reason why is because psychology tells us these are the motivations that keep us going. The information I'm going to share with you in these next two weeks isn't uh, a cakewalk. It's not uh, super easy. You don't just absorb what I say and instantly get better. This is going to require focus energy, dedication, a schedule. You're going to have to really hear me, let the information sink in and put it into practice. When it gets hard, when you get tired, when you feel frustrated, when you are sick of rehab, you go back to this motivation. You go back to your why. So what I want you to do is post some stickies all around the house. I want you to be in touch with your motivation. You could say, I want to be better for me because I want to drive again. I want to smile more. Uh, you might say, you know what? My wife has been so good to me. I want to be a better husband to her. I want to play with my grandkids. You know, I want to uh, go back to being a part of my community. I want to be able to make a contribution to other stroke survivors, right? All of that stuff is your fuel. That's the gasoline in your tank for doing the hard work that we are about to do together. Please remind yourself of these reasons often. If you are a caregiver, always go back to that. Remember, the reason we're doing this is X, Y, and Z. Very, very important. So are you guys ready to start with the learning? We're gonna get into rule number one. Oh, pardon me, not rule number one yet. We're gonna start with some education to get us to rule number one. Okay, so this is the traditional definition of a stroke. An interruption in the blood supply to the brain. Okay, sounds all right. Commonly measured in terms of the physical damage that is done, and it either happens because too little blood got to the brain, right? or too much blood got into the brain. And we measure this by things like MRI, CT scans. The problem with a lack of blood or too much blood is that the blood carries the two primary fuels for the brain. And these are oxygen and glucose, good old blood sugar, okay? The interesting thing about neurons or brain cells is that they cannot store their fuels of oxygen and glucose for more than a few minutes, okay? These are not squirrels who get to store their nuts and they last all winter. Brain cells have a very short lifespan and they need constant and steady supplies of their fuel. After about five minutes of a brain cell or brain cells not having oxygen or low, poor quality oxygen, there is going to be brain damage. Now this largely depends on the health of the brain that is supplied by that blood vessel. If you have a very healthy brain going into your stroke, you can afford more time of decreased or no oxygen before you start to see cell death. Once we get to about seven or nine minutes, we are gonna have more damage. And not only are we gonna see individual small areas of brain cells dying, we are going to see networks, groupings, family members of brain cells dying, unfortunately. Once we get past nine minutes, this really gets into some very significant stroke damage. And this is why we always say that time is brain. We always want to encourage people for rapid medical attention because it's just so, so, so important. The size and the location of where your stroke happened, again, and the health of your overall brain, this is what's gonna give you your specific symptoms, okay? Now, this is interesting. Stroke damage really happens in one of two ways. The first one is logical, and it's how you've thought of it, okay? It is, I had a stroke in my left frontal lobe, and I have damage in my left frontal lobe. Yes, that's absolutely true. But the brain does not act in individual clusters, okay? The brain is unbelievably intricately connected in a series of these networks. You can almost think of them as kind of like rubber bands that kind of connect different groupings in the brain. So you may have had a left frontal stroke 
But guess what? Your left frontal lobe is also connected to your right cerebellum. So you may have right cerebellar symptoms, even though you actually had a left frontal stroke. Isn't that interesting? So this is your first really uh, awesome, interesting piece of brain health information. You may have symptoms in a whole other part of your brain, even though you've been told this whole time, guess what, you had a left frontal brain stroke. Well, you might also have some symptoms you can't make heads or tails of because when you go to Google, left frontal stroke, they tell you X, Y, and Z, but guess what, maybe you also have these other symptoms. This is why it is so, so, so important to see a neuropsychologist because this is exactly what we do and I'm gonna tell you more about that as we go through our talk together today. All strokes are the result of a problem in the vascular system. So if we're gonna start with really becoming experts in stroke, we always gotta go back to blood flow. That's what it's all about. So our vascular system is really uh, in two parts. The first one is called your cardiovascular system, right? And that's basically from about here down, okay? Then we have something called your cerebrovascular system, and that's basically from your carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries, which are in the back of your head, all the way up. Any vascular system from the neck up is cerebrovascular, and any vascular system from your neck down is cardiovascular. It's all the same. It's all interconnected tubes that bring this blood with its oxygen and its glucose to different body parts, but we just separate it for scientific know-how. It's basically made up of the heart is kind of the hub, right? And then we have arteries, veins, and capillaries. The arteries bring blood from your heart. Uh, think of it like this. It goes away from your heart. So A, arteries, A, away, okay? Veins actually bring the blood all the way back to your heart. So the vascular system, uh, as it relates to cardiovascular, is basically a long series of getting out blood, returning it back to the heart, pumping it back out again. And in between, we have capillaries, which basically connect the two. The main job of all the vascular system is to carry this oxygen and glucose-rich blood to a very complicated interconnected system. So again, if you really start to think about uh, brain health, it's really all about blood flow. It's really all about vascular health. So when blood vessels are healthy and well-connected, they have four characteristics. The first one is that they are open. Okay, so can you guys see on my slide there, we've got a blood vessel and it's nice and open. This allows for the free movement of the blood back and forth, again, bringing in all of that oxygen. The next one is that when a blood vessel is healthy, it is strong but it's also flexible and elastic. And that's really interesting. And this is really where blood pressure comes in, is that the harder we're working, the more the blood vessels, when they're healthy, have the ability to make themselves smaller so the blood can get through more uh, forcefully. Kind of think of a garden hose. And you know how when you put your finger on the garden hose at the end, it comes out really fast? Well, a healthy blood vessel is in charge of that itself. It can actually get smaller when it wants to have more intense blood delivered somewhere, but it can also relax if we are relaxed and we don't need that uptick in the energy for our cells. Healthy blood vessels are also smooth. They keep the blood moving freely. There's no obstruction. There's no potholes. There's no um, boulders, right? It just goes through freely from A to Z. And the last one is that healthy blood vessels are coordinated. This is uh, a team. This is uh, not a solo sport. This is a team with a quarterback, right? We could say that's the heart. And we've got all these other players. And the whole idea is that they're constantly communicating, constantly supporting each other back and forth. When the vascular system is unhealthy for a variety of reasons, we'll talk about these in a minute, unfortunately, one of the big consequences is stroke. So let's go through all the different kinds of stroke. And I want you to be starting to personalize this information already. I want you to, uh, when you see your type of stroke, you know, think to yourself, all right, there I am. The most common type of stroke is called an ischemic stroke. And this is about 80% of you. This happens when something, a blood clot, a fatty deposit, uh, uh, emboli, a thrombus, a piece of cholesterol, blocks the flow of blood to a part of the brain. The most common subtypes of ischemic stroke 
are thrombotic or embolic. And what that means is that a blood clot forms somewhere else in the body, typically in the heart. You can get a pulmonary embolism from the lung. You can get a deep vein thrombosis from uh, the leg. Some people have what we call factor V Leiden, which is a mutation of um, a clotting factor in the blood, which unfortunately makes you form these pretty big blood clots. And by the time they travel all the way up to the brain, they can get stuck and that's your, that's your obstruction. And then anything beyond that is where we see the stroke damage. In contrast, about 20% of you have had hemorrhagic strokes. So with ischemic, what that means is you've had too little blood. With hemorrhagic, it means that you've had too much blood, okay? So this is when a blood vessel bursts or when a weakened blood vessel leaks blood into your brain. The most common types of hemorrhagic strokes that we can have are intracerebral. And again, these are just fancy words, but our job here is let's break this down and understand what these scientists and brain doctors are talking about. So in intracerebral, all that that means is it's actually in your brain matter, okay? So intra means within, cerebral means brain. You can also have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now what this means is in the tiny space between your skull and your brain, there are three layers of kind of like webbing that do all sorts of great things for our brain, mostly kind of cushion it and our immune system works at that level. We can clear things out of our brain there. It's a really intricate, very delicate system. A lot of times the blood vessels that keep that webbing together can have a little bit of a bleed and that's where we can get a subarachnoid hemorrhage. People can also have mini strokes. Now, a lot of times you folks have maybe had a mini stroke and then went on to have a bigger stroke. Because we still need to improve stroke education, a lot of times people don't really know that they have had a mini stroke. So sometimes these are called silent strokes and people might not even know they've had it. Some people have them in their sleep. Um, but where you typically find out about this is when they do a brain scan on you, an MRI or a CT, the radiologist might say that they see small white spots in your brain, okay? And that suggests previous damage. Now, when you hear this, this can definitely be jarring because, my God, I had a stroke and I didn't even know it. The way I want you to think about mini strokes is they really are warning signs that means you have to get very aggressive about stroke prevention and really educate yourself so you don't miss a stroke if you wind up having one. The other um, type of experience within the spectrum of stroke is called a TIA, and that's just some initials that mean transient ischemic attack. The key thing about a TIA is I always want you to remember the letter T, transient, right, fleeting. What this means is you've had a temporary blockage in a blood vessel that causes symptoms, but the symptoms completely stop or go away. Usually it's about 15 minutes, but you can go up to a few hours. But the key here is it does not leave permanent damage. I have found a lot of people are uh, uninformed about this. So people who've had strokes will say to me, oh, I, I, I was told this was a TIA. A TIA leaves no permanent damage in the actual brain matter, and there's no functional change, meaning you shouldn't have any lingering symptoms. A TIA comes and a TIA goes. The next one is cryptogenic, and I wonder how many of you fall into this camp. This has got to be an incredibly frustrating experience when no reason for your stroke can be found. This is uh, described as having an unknown origin for your stroke, undetermined. And this can happen um, because the doctors didn't look for all possible causes. Um, but the truth is, unfortunately, there's some strokes that truly are spontaneous. It's kind of a scientific anomaly. A third of people with ischemic strokes don't ever get answers about uh, what happened. And this happens much more likely when you're under the age of 45. So why do people have strokes? Well, there are many reasons, but I want you to understand the five most common kinds for two reasons. Again, my philosophy is that knowledge is empowering, but this is also key for stroke prevention. I know many of you are highly anxious about having another stroke, and the key to not having another stroke is to reduce the risk by figuring out what it is that gave you your first stroke and making sure you control it to the degree possible. So these are the top five reasons that folks have strokes. The first one is high blood pressure. If there's anything medically that you learned from me today, it is I don't care if this is the reason you had your stroke or not, 
please, please, please get serious about your blood pressure. It's extremely important. Next one is high cholesterol. So a little piece of that cholesterol or fatty deposit can break off and travel up to the brain. Type two diabetes, AFib, atrial fibrillation, and arterial dissections. Now, before we go into these, I do wanna say, when these are the cause of a stroke, it's typically because they are uncontrolled. So do not freak out if I just went through all four of those and you said, oh shoot, that's me. You can be okay, even if you have these, if you know how to control it. Let's talk about high blood pressure for a minute. Blood pressure can affect your brain in two ways. It can happen very slowly over time in phases, and that's actually most typical or it can also happen suddenly during a very stressful event. So remember I was saying before that healthy blood vessels have the ability to open and close depending on the demands of the body and what you're doing. <laughs> well, if you have narrow blood vessels because cholesterol has built up between the walls and now instead of having a blood vessel that's like this, we've got cholesterol in the wall, so now we've got one that's like this, your heart has to pump a lot harder to get the blood flow through the blood vessel to get to the network of arteries or veins. This is basically high blood pressure. The consequence is that that force that has to go through the blood vessel creates friction. And that friction breaks up the lining. Remember when it's healthy, it's smooth. The smooth lining of the blood vessel causes these little like tears, kind of like little micro damage over time. Now what happens in those little pockets, in that little bit of damage, is that more of these fatty deposits, the cholesterol, fill in the spaces of the tears and turn into these hard calcium deposits, okay? So now what happens, instead of having these smooth, flexible blood vessels, now we've got these kind of hard, almost like a plastic, kind of very inflexible blood vessel that gets thick and it further narrow. So now instead of having a healthy blood vessel that's like this, between the impact of cholesterol, we've gone down to this, and then the vascular system's way of compensating for the cholesterol is to make it even shorter. Remember the garden hose example. So if the, if the water's having a hard time coming out of the hose, what do you do, right? You narrow the uh, output to make it come out faster, but when we do that, we're really getting these rips and the tears inside the blood vessels. Notice how I was saying that the problem here is really when there's cholesterol inside the blood vessel. So what I want you to know about high cholesterol and high blood pressure is they're very bad best friends. When they happen together, you need to be especially concerned and proactive because it's really when they're together that we see the most damage. So cholesterol moves throughout the blood in these kind of like little sphere-like shapes. Can you see my picture there? Called lipoproteins. And there's two types of these particles. And the ratio of your two types of cholesterol is really important for you understanding your own risk. So the LDL cholesterol is the bad stuff. That's the stuff that we don't want. That's the stuff that builds up on the artery walls and causes that damage and the narrowing that I was just telling you about. The HDL is your good cholesterol. Now, I think it's cool to know why it's good cholesterol because on the surface, that sounds a little confusing to me. The way the good cholesterol works is it actually goes around your blood and it munches up all the bad cholesterol, takes it out of the blood vessels, brings it to your liver, and then your liver can break it down and release it from your body. Pretty cool, right? So the risk for stroke comes when you're high cholesterol, you have too much LDL, too little HDL, and again, we see this narrowing of the blood vessels. Now, when a piece of cholesterol that's been kind of uh, suctioned to the side of the blood vessel breaks off, it's going to travel downstream until it gets to a narrow enough blood vessel where it's going to stop blood flow, okay? And there are three parts of the body where we find the smallest blood vessels. They are in your feet, in your eyes, and in your brain. So you can have a blood little bit of cholesterol that breaks off, you know, in your lung, okay? It can travel freely all the way up your carotid artery. It's too small to get stuck. But when it gets all the way into that inner part of your brain where the blood vessels are teeny, teeny, tiny, I mean, less than a strand of hair, teeny, teeny, tiny, that's where they're gonna clog it up because it can't get past the walls. I hope that that makes sense.
The issue with type 2 diabetes is when it's uncontrolled. A lot of you might have diabetes, so again, don't get scared. Remember, we're here to make you feel stronger, uh, not, more, not more concerned. So again, over time is where we see difficulty from type 2 diabetes. So too much sugar in the blood vessel, again, causes trouble with blood flow. I feel like a broken record. We're always going back to this blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. And what happens with type 2 diabetes is you get a lot of inflammation. Now remember, I keep saying we want wide open, healthy blood vessels. What happens when there is inflammation? Ah, we're going to live a little bit smaller, right? So again, once diabetes sets up, what does the, the brain and the body do to compensate? High blood pressure, because now we want them to be uh, we want the blood flow to be more intense so we can compensate for the inflammation, okay? So when blood vessels in the brain are damaged, that fuel, the oxygen and the glucose cannot get through and cells die. So what you wanna be careful of with type two diabetes is spikes in your blood sugar. If you run a little high or a little low, I'm not getting too worried about that. If you go under 80 or if you go above 120, 140 for sure, this is when you are actually getting brain damage. You are getting blood vessel damage from your diabetes. So the key is to keep those numbers closer, closer together, okay? The big risk for stroke comes when you have multiple risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type two diabetes. If you have all three of those, you need to take your vascular health very serious. Number four is atrial fibrillation. Some people call this AFib. This is the most common type of heartbeat irregularity. It's an abnormal, rapid electrical pulse that causes the heart to not contract fully. So the heart typically has a very steady rhythm of contracting and relaxing, right? This is basically our heartbeat. When this does not happen and the contraction doesn't happen at a regular tempo, it leaves just enough time where the blood can kind of pool a little bit in the chambers of the heart and it's not able to empty out its blood completely. This slow or stagnant blood flow can cause a blood clot to form. When the heart is not pumping regularly, again, the, the body is so, so smart. What it's gonna to do to compensate is it's gonna to wanna to contract extra hard to try to get itself back in rhythm. Now, if you've got a blood clot sitting in a heart chamber and you pump extra hard, what's gonna happen? It's gonna shoot out and now you've got a blood clot floating through the blood vessels. And again, it's going to go as far as it can before it gets stuck. Where it gets stuck is where the stroke happens. That reasoning actually applies to, I know there's some of you listening who have that factor five where you have the difficulty with blood clotting. It's the same thing. A clot forms somewhere in the body, it shoots off and it's gonna go until it basically gets wedged in too small of a blood vessel and that's when it's going to cut off um, blood supply. The next one is an arterial dissection. This is a traumatic tear in the inside lining of a blood vessel. And what you can get is either a pooling of blood between the layers of the blood vessel, or you can actually get, uh, it completely can open, and now we've got blood going everywhere in the brain. Dissections can either be spontaneous or traumatic. So let me just tell you a little bit more about that briefly. The blood supply to the brain is absolutely fascinating. So a lot of you hear about carotid arteries, right? So the carotids are of course right here and they literally are about the size of my pointer fingers, okay? In the back of the brain, almost the same position, we have something called the vertebral arteries and they're about the size of my pinkies. These two big, vessel systems basically go all the way up into the brain and have different branches that come out and they form a web or you know a, a family of blood vessels and in the middle there is a circle called the circle of willis and again so smart this, this biology this neurobiology because if you can actually be fine with a completely blocked carotid artery because the rest of the system within that circle can compensate for it. Isn't that fascinating? But inside the middle part of our brain, what we call the subcortical part, this is where those teeny tiny blood vessels come in. This is the one that are a strand of hair or even about a quarter of the diameter of a strand of hair. Is that not unbelievable? So when we're talking about dissections, typically these happen in the carotids in the front or the vertebrals in the back. And it really depends on how bad the blood vessel kind of split and how much blood gets spilled out into the brain. That really depends. So when it's spontaneous, it can be a genetic issue. It can be 
um, over time, those blood vessels have kind of weakened and it just takes one episode of high blood pressure to kind of split it. Or they can also be traumatic. This can be from a fall, a car accident. Unfortunately, chiropractic adjustments are one of the big reasons that people can have these. Occasionally, I do go to a chiropractor. I have sciatica sometimes. I never let them touch my neck. And all due respect to chiropractors, if you have had a stroke, I would not let them do a neck adjustment on you. So again, once you have had your stroke, right, the key is to know you're having a stroke. And you might have heard of the acronym FAST, right? That's kind of the last year's way of thinking about stroke symptoms. We have to change this. And I have a responsibility to talk about it. And so do you as a stroke survivor. What we have to use going forward is be fast. And the reason is we left too many of our brothers and sisters behind who had what we call posterior strokes, okay? When you have a stroke in the back of the brain, you're not gonna have the stroke symptoms that people have stereotyped as a stroke. You're not gonna have the drooping face, you're not gonna have trouble with an arm, you're not gonna have trouble speaking. You're gonna have balance issues and you're going to have weird things happen with your eyes. Many of you, if you've had these strokes, have had a very traumatic experience with emergency rooms because many times people get told um, they're intoxicated, uh, they're hypochondriacs, there's nothing wrong. Even emergency room physicians are not across the board on top of this. So please remember, be fast. Balance, eyes, face, arm, speech, and then time is absolutely key. So once you've had the stroke, okay, you then enter the medical system. And this is where I wanna to try to bring in your personal experience. So the first thing that I think of is the geography of where you've had your stroke matters. So what do I mean by this? This is where the trauma can start, okay? Many people become extremely anxious and very avoidant about physically where they were when they had your stroke. For some people, it's very hard to go back to the room in your house where it happened, the store, your car, uh, that time of day. And I just wanna, this is where, you know, I hope some of the healing begins for some of you. If that's happened to you and you have judged, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I being so weird? Why don't I wanna go back to that part of the house? This is a part of post-stroke trauma and post-stroke anxiety. And we normalize that stuff here, okay? This is completely normal. Your feelings of anxiety can be reduced. You can learn over time how not to be beholden to that anxiety, okay? After you have been brought into an acute medical system, a hospital, this is where your stroke care begins, okay? Most people stay in the hospital for about four days when they've had an ischemic stroke. Hemorrhagic, it's a little more complicated. That's about seven days. And that's because with hemorrhagic strokes, remember, we have too much blood in the brain, okay? The brain and the skull um, don't have a lot of uh, vacancy. There's not a lot of room up there for visitors like blood cells, okay? So if we start to get something in the brain that shouldn't be there, what we actually get is something called a herniation. And this is an amazing thing the brain can do. The brain can actually move itself over, push up against the front part of the skull. And when we take a picture of the brain, we can actually see this and that blood has pulled up. Many people with hemorrhagic strokes need a craniotomy to pull the blood out because what can happen over time is if you don't get it out, the brain, even though it can scrunch up and go kind of up and left or up and right, the danger is that it's gonna go back. Now, once we get too much blood pressure and um, you know, physical mass on the back part of the brain, we worry about the brain stem and we worry about sudden death. So some of you with a hemorrhagic have maybe been through a craniotomy. This is often described as a very overwhelming time for you and your family. It's really different. You might have hazy memories of this time. You might remember every single thing in painstaking detail. Once you are in the medical system, they really have three initial goals for you. The first one is saving your life, stabilization, that's it. The next one is diagnosis. Is this a blood clot? Might this person need clot busting drugs, the TPA? Uh, where in the brain did this happen? They have to get you scanned right away. The next one is the earliest treatment to minimize damage. Do you need a brain surgery, okay? Um, you know, can we bring this person's blood pressure down, right? Is their blood sugar sky high? It's very much a triage situation. Once you've been there for, you know, a couple of days, our goals start to change a little bit. And then we can start to think about 
what happened here? Okay, what were these risk factors? Why did this person have the stroke? And we can start to get a better sense of brain damage. If you have a brain scan within you know, an hour of having a stroke, you're not necessarily gonna see the full, what they call evolution of the stroke. You need, for many of you, you know this, you got scanned immediately and maybe the next day, a few days later, they scanned you again. It's because there's a core of stroke damage and that's visible right away. But over time, we can also see, unfortunately, that the stroke can spread a little bit. And this umbrella is called the penumbra. This again is why it's critical to get yourself to emergency medicine because we have some control over that outside of the stroke. If we get early enough help, we can actually minimize that a little bit. And your recovery starts the minute you are stabilized, okay? And by stabilized, I mean you're not gonna die, you're gonna stay here with us, okay? Recovery can take many forms from this time. Maybe you went to an inpatient rehab, maybe you got sent home to do outpatient, Maybe you went to skilled nursing. Uh, maybe you just got sent home with no care at all. Uh, maybe you've had to be in control. Maybe your family has been the one in control. Recovery just kind of goes all over the place. Again, this is why we need to personalize stroke rehab. Once you start to get your head on about what you need to do with stroke recovery, if you group all of the interventions, all of the things that can be done for you, they basically fall into three camps. And the way you're gonna find your personal path forward is a combination of all of these for the best results. So I wanna go through them with you. The very first one, this is good old fashioned neuroplasticity. This means that repair can be done to damage cells and there are things that we can do to help them regrow and return to their healthy biological functioning. So one example of this might be hand stretching exercises over and over and over and over again to reestablish that brain connection between hand and brain, okay? I'm gonna teach you in this uh, session, this series, how to actually do this because it might be a little different than you've actually been told. Requires a ton more practice than you might think. Next one is learning to compensate. Okay, this is when you can actually take a non-damaged part of your brain and retrain it to do something that another part of your brain has to do. This is the whole concept of plasticity is the brain is not hardwired. We have some ability to manipulate it to our benefit. So one example of this might be learning to use a calendar to rely um, to use that for your memory instead of just being able to remember it okay so now you can actually train you know the writing part of your brain the organizational part of your brain to reinforce information instead of just relying that it's immediately automatically available in your memory and the next one unfortunately i don't think gets talked about enough and this is acceptance of changes i really like to think that I am one of the biggest recovery cheerleaders that you will ever meet. I am quite optimistic and I believe that science and compassion and love and, and support can do a whole lot. But I am also a realist. Being trained as a scientist, I always have to go back to the evidence. And I think that the truth is for many of you that you may not get a 100% recovery, especially because I really validate the psychological trauma. So what I mean by that is you're not gonna come out on the other side as a carbon copy of the you that you were before. So I think that you can fight like hell in this recovery for a return of function, but I'm also gonna try to get in your head that I also want you to fight like hell for your acceptance of what is different, okay? And so this means changing expectations, redefining what you consider to be success and where you get your identity and your self-esteem from, focusing more on your strengths than your weaknesses. Now, the thing is, I know some of you are thinking in your head like, acceptance, doesn't that mean giving up? No, it really doesn't. It really means coming from a place of wholeness instead of feeling like you have been broken by the stroke. So one example of this might be being okay with not being able to tie your shoes anymore and using Velcro shoes, right? If you're really okay about that, then that issue doesn't bother you anymore because you've made your peace with it. So really in this series, what I hope to teach you is the strategies for using all three of these post-stroke interventions. Now, what's so cool is you might think that neuroplasticity is just involved with my first one, that it's, it's neuroplasticity only matters when I retrain a part of my brain or when I make 
uh, new brain cells grow. No, actually, it's required for acceptance too. When we are flexible in the way we do things and in the way we think about things, it all requires neuroplasticity. So what is this fancy word? This is the, the, the concept that the brain has the extraordinary ability to grow new connections and reorganize after damage. So the star of your neuroplastic recovery are these beautiful neurons, okay? That's actually why I chose these awesome glass stars uh, above me because I want you to see what a neuron is. I want you to really get intimate with this part of your brain. But I don't want you to think that these neurons are really uh, the only stars in your recovery. And so the symbolism of why I've got this bigger star on the other side of my shoulder is to tell you that you are the real star of all this, okay? And so I love beautiful objects and I love brain art and these things. And so when I was trying to design my background, I just thought, man, that's so cool that we could get that message across. And also my mom made these for me, so that's extra special. So I wanna teach you a little bit about the amazing brain cell. So neuroplasticity, again, is given the right set of circumstances, your brain can do absolutely amazing things. So the way brain brain cells communicate is through these dendrites okay so if I use my awesome stars right here there are these little legs that come out on the outside and what they do is they touch other brain cells almost physically there's a tiny little gap where there's chemical exchange and this is how they transfer information to and from each other so if you look down on my picture where there is a synapse you might be able to see my little cursor here this is where we take all the information we've gathered in the cell and we push it along to the next cell, okay? So neurons have to regrow very close to each other in order to reestablish communication. If we have the core of the stroke damage, what we're really hoping to get neuroplasticity on are the, the brain cells that exist around the stroke damage. This is why, unfortunately, the bigger your stroke, the harder it is to recover because there's less neurons to actually connect each other around the stroke area. Reorganization, neuroplasticity, happens by rebuilding and rewiring brain networks. It does not happen brain cell by brain cell. So remember before I said the brain is intricately connected and I almost want you to think about them like little rubber bands that kind of connect everything. So I want you to look at my picture here and I want you to see this might be the representation, for example, of an apple pie. This is so fascinating to me. So an apple pie has many components, one of them are your brain has to know all the kind of apples. You might have memories of making an apple pie with your grandma. You have memories of the smell. You might know how to make a pie crust if you're a really awesome person. Um, all of that information about an apple pie is all over your brain and there's these little tiny wires, little tiny rubber bands that connect it all. The way your brain is organized is based on your previous life experiences, your education, your interests, your family. And these networks start off pretty simple when we're little, and over time they get more and more complex because there's more redundancy, there's more overlap between them, okay? So in a stroke, what we know happens is either the network itself gets damaged or access to the network gets damaged. So what do I mean by this? This is a perfect example of when you know a word darn well, but you cannot find it. Now this happens to all of us, right? But if you've had any type of stroke uh, in your left frontal or temporal area, you are gonna have this issue. You know darn well, you know that word, you cannot find it. It is one of the most frustrating things that can happen. But what that means is that access to the network is damaged. And again, this is where we get at that indirect damage issue. And we don't talk about that enough. And again, that's why personalized Cognitive evaluations are so key because someone like me can explain to you exactly why you're having the symptoms that you have. Here is a message of hope. I never want you to forget this. A stroke is a focal injury. It's very rare that the whole network is gone, okay? So our job in recovery is basically to encourage this reorganization through the process of neuroplasticity, okay? So again, what we're trying to do is get more sprouts. Like let's say here, this one on my left, the, the teeny tiny little guy, let's just say that's a, a damaged neuron after a stroke. All we're trying to do is get more and more legs on the sucker, right? We want more and more dendrites so this little guy can get out there and communicate with other brain cells. Now, 
if you are a smart cookie, like I know you all are, you're sitting here like, of course, Dr. Sullivan, this is what we want. But how do you do that? Okay, it all comes down to these two words, enriched environment. It means the type of lifestyle you choose to live will directly result in the sprouting of new little dendrites, or it will not. And that is the information that is at the heart of this group and in my book is, okay, we know this, enriched environment, but what is it? It's literally a set of instructions that once you know them, oh my God, you're gonna be like, the whole world opens up for recovery. So I wanted to show you a picture to help this concept come to life. So a lot of what we know about the brain actually comes from animal models. And we typically use a rat or a mouse to teach us about the human brain. So next time you see one of those guys running around your kitchen, don't be so fast to, to kick it out. You know, you gotta give a little, give a little moment of thanks to that little mouse. Um, so what they do is they uh, take different mice and they put them in different environments. So first look at the little guy all by himself. Okay, that's what we call an impoverished environment. That is a rat mouse he's all by himself that's key all by himself no socialization he only gets water in that bottle okay there's no toys okay and he's prevented from sleeping normally that is a bad brain environment then we have an enriched environment look how little mice friends are in there frolicking about yes they have water but they also have sweet milk in the other little dropper there for getting their liquids. Look how many toys they have. They are very stimulated. They have relationships. They have a hierarchy. They communicate. And when we sacrifice both of these animals and we look at them under a microscope, I want you to look at their different brain cells. Knowing that dendrites, the little sprouts, are key to brain health, which one of those brain cells do you want? Do you want the impoverished one where not a lot of connections can really happen? Or do you want the enriched one where you are going to be able to make those new connections and experience neuroplasticity? Yeah! So neuroscience research tells us that the single most successful recovery strategy following all types of brain injury, including stroke, comes down to two simple things. We have to surround you with a complex, stimulating environment with periods of focused, and repetitive activity, this is your rehab, juxtaposed with periods of high quality rest, including all the phases of sleep, REM and non-REM. It's literally as simple as that. Complex environment, high quality sleep, okay? But each one of those has many, many, many branches that we have to talk to you about. That's the 10 rules of rehab. How do you figure out between when you're active, what you should do, and when you're resting, what you should do, okay? The magic comes when we demystify those two concepts. So that is the introduction to our stroke recovery group. I ask you, dear learners, are you ready to begin this stroke recovery journey with me with these 10 rules of rehab? Woo, I'm super excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, number one, rule number one is make your map. What do I mean by this? The first thing is if you are going to be empowered in this journey, you have got to become an information gatherer. I want you to get yourself a notebook if you don't have one and you're gonna write on it, my stroke recovery journey, and you are going to start gathering information. The number one thing to do to start this journey off right is you have got to understand your personal stroke. To even just know if you had an ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke, not good enough. There are three things I am sending you out in the world on a mission to figure out until we meet again. The first one is where exactly in your brain did the stroke happen? Why did your stroke happen if they know? What were your personal risk factors that led to the stroke? And oh, I love this one. Number three is how has your stroke affected you as a whole person? Unless you've had a team of really awesome doctors, I'm going to suggest to you that you may not have contemplated this question in the way that I want you to yet. The first thing is where in your brain did the stroke happen? The way you're gonna find this out is you're gonna request your medical records from your hospital 
or when you went to the neurologist, okay? You can call them in the next week. Hey, I would like for you to send me a copy of my MRI. You can um, call the hospital and ask for your hospital records. There is such gold in your stroke medical records. There's so much information that doesn't necessarily trickle down to you. One is it was an emergency when you were in the hospital, so I'm gonna cut the docs a break. But unfortunately, because of all the pressures on hospital systems, I say this all the time, the face-to-face -face with our docs is declining in a very disappointing way. And many times this information does not get to you. If you can get a copy of your MRI, you are welcome to email me a copy of it. I can't interpret pictures, that's outside my realm, but if you have a report where they describe where in your brain you had it, I will personally respond to your email and explain to you where you had the stroke, it's very important. Number two, why did this stroke happen? Again, you can find this in your medical records, you can ask your neurologist. It is key that you work extremely hard to reduce these risk factors. You do not want a second stroke, so again, be assertive when you meet with these people and ask them, what can I do to reduce my risk of having another stroke? So now we get to number three, my favorite question of this whole lecture. Remember I said at the beginning that strokes get medicalized? Ooh, I'm talking so much. Do you guys like how I'm so color coordinated with everything? What I mean by this is there's such an emphasis on the physical effects of stroke, right? It's almost like if the doctor can't see it, well, you know, just does not get validated enough. So yes, we know all about hemiparesis and we know a lot about visual field loss, but why aren't we talking more about the financial implications of stroke? Why aren't we talking more about the implications on intimacy of all kinds with your friends, feeling confident in your body, feeling comfortable in the world, changes in taste, okay? So here is an invitation from me to you as you start this new way of thinking about your stroke journey. I want you to take this question very serious and in the next week before we meet again, I really want you to spend some time reflecting on all of these areas, okay? So yes, physically, what has changed? What's different? Cognitive, what do I mean by cognitive? Your ability to pay attention, to multitask, to remember, to speak, to find your words, to find your way. Mood, oh my gosh. We're gonna talk in the future about post-stroke depression, post-stroke anxiety, post-stroke post-traumatic stress disorder. There's so much that can change here. Behavior, this is the way you act. Impulsivity is one of the hardest things to deal with after a stroke because you blurt. You say things you don't want to say, and then you regret it. But the problem is we blame ourselves after that happened because we haven't validated that that's a neurological symptom that's just as real as if you can't use your left hand. So I want you to start thinking a little bit more about that. Social, right? Not feeling comfortable um, in yourself or with small groups. Maybe you're embarrassed. Maybe, uh, you know, unfortunately, people can be real jerks sometimes. And sometimes, you know, your friends don't know how to react to the stroke. So people find themselves a little bit more lonely. Intimacy, again, you know, experiencing it, giving it, being comfortable, being in that vulnerable position. Financial, why are we not talking more about the financial toll on people with strokes? These medical bills are flipping ridiculous. I mean, did you ever try to, you know, get an aspirin when you go to the, the, the hospital? My gosh, it's $600. Can you imagine what it's like to get a craniotomy? I mean, it's unbelievable. Sensory issues. Many people have difficulty hearing, seeing, smelling, feeling, pain syndromes. All these things are very, very real. So these are some examples, okay? And maybe in some of these areas, you haven't even thought of opening this up as a concept to yourself because no one has really laid it out or validated it. So I want you to look at all these things, okay? These are all very real things. And what I mean by make your map is if you don't know that these are symptoms, you're never gonna recover from them because you've got to call a spade a spade. We have to know where you're starting, this is your map before I can tell you where it is you need to go, okay? So I want you to spend some quiet time in the next few days reflecting on what has changed in all of these areas of function. So again, we're gonna 
send you an interactive worksheet, a handout within about 24 hours, and you're gonna have a write-in thing that you can sit there with, with your spouse, with your friend, your physical therapist, and get real about what has happened to you. You really need to acknowledge this. It can really be difficult, it can be overwhelming to really be honest with yourself, but I'm asking you as an important first step in this recovery journey we're gonna go on together, I really want you to do that. So making your map means, where am I now and where do I want to go? This applies to anything. You wanna walk better, you wanna talk better. It doesn't matter, you have to know exactly where you are. See on this map here, we've got these two things, right? So the question is, well, okay, Dr. Sullivan, I hear you, but like, how am I supposed to know? I'm not necessarily an expert in what my problems are. The best way to make your map is I want you to find the very best experts in your area and participate in a detailed series of assessments. Okay, so what do I mean by this? This is basically getting a referral. You know, maybe for example, you've been in PT, physical therapy for some time for your gait, and that's been a great focus, and you uh, have an awesome physical therapist, right? Maybe through this journey, this exercise we just did on reflection, you also think to yourself, you know what, I've also had this like pins and needles feeling in my arm, but like my walking is so impaired that I haven't even really focused on my arm and I can use it, but man, it kind of hurts, okay? So you're gonna go to your PT or your neurologist or your doc and say, you know, I haven't really focused on this yet, but I also think this is a part of my stroke and I, I need to know who should I see about this, okay? A detailed assessment should really do three things. The first one is it should be able to tell you exactly what is this impairment you're having. So for example, with trouble walking, okay, you could have trouble feeling your feet. You could have trouble with uh, the back part of your brain helping you with balance. You could have trouble because your vision is off and you have double vision. A good assessment will say to you, you know, Billy, the reason you're having this trouble is because you had a cerebellar stroke and your coordination between your left foot and your right foot is not working well. Once you know this, now instead of it being a mystery as to why you can't walk well, you are now empowered to say, okay, it's a coordination issue and now I know what I can do with coordination. The second thing a good assessment should do is it should give you realistic short and long-term recovery goals. So remember, this is your map. Your map is here I am now and I know exactly where I'm at and here's realistically where I wanna go. If you don't know the difference between here you are and here you wanna be, I'm afraid you're going to be lost. This is why Make Your Map is my first rule of rehab. We have to know the landscape. We have to know what country we're in before we can start a journey, right? I want them to explain to you the specific treatments, therapies, or compensations that you need to do to help achieve these goals. It's not good enough to say, well, guess what? You have a coordination issue. That's when you get to respectfully say, wow, I appreciate that that's helpful, but what's the very next step that I can take in order to recover that function, okay? So when I say go out and find your experts, I've made a list for you of all the people that you're most likely to need in an ideal stroke care team. And look at who I put at the top of the list, neuropsychology. I know I'm biased, uh, but you have to appreciate this. I went into this field because I personally think it offers the best of brain health. We are very focused on person-centered care. We do a lot of evaluation, cognitive testing, but it all runs through the filter of who you are as a person with your life experience. Our job is to give you an excellent, detailed assessment of that cognition, the way your brain's been affected in terms of thinking and memory and feeling your mood, your behavior. We give you a personal explanation of what's going on, but what I love the most about my job is the personal recommendations for how to get you better. A neurologist is a medical doctor of physician. Psychologists are typically doctors from uh, doctorates. I have my PhD in the philosophy of psychology. Uh, neurologists have medical degrees, right, in physical medicine, the brain. They are really good at specialized tests and doing great physical exams to help you figure out the specific type of deficits that you have. They're good at identifying risk factors for stroke. I would love all of you to see a physiatrist. I don't know if many of you have access to them, but when I was at UNC, it was physiatrists that actually ran the unit. A physiatrist really coordinates 
rehab of all kinds, okay? It sounds almost like a psychiatrist. It's not. Sounds like a physical therapist. Nope. A physiatrist is an expert in the way the brain and the body interact, and they can really give you awesome assessments and help you with treatment plans. Next one, a lot of people don't use these folks enough is orthotics and prosthetics. This is gear. These are braces. This is technology. These people are absolutely awesome at being creative and personalizing your care. Next one, of course, is the awesome physical therapist. What I get told from my patients time and time again is that their best buddies in their stroke recovery are their PTs, their occupational therapist, and their speech therapist. And the reason this is is because you actually get to know them and you have a relationship with them. Man, oh man, do I wish more of you had a relationship with your neurologist. I pride myself with my patients on I hope developing an actual human to human relationship with them, not this stupid old school hierarchy of doctor and patient. Please find people that believe in your expertise as well. Physical therapists are great with the body. Occupational therapists are great with everyday functions like getting dressed, eating. Speech therapists are not just for speech, they also help with swallowing and cognitive rehab. Counselors are critical in this journey. God, talking, processing with someone who's not your immediate family can be unbelievably valuable. The grieving, the adjustment, the post-traumatic growth, there's so much that a good counselor can help you with. Next one I put on here, because I really think this is quite healthy, is massage therapist. Oh my gosh, help if you have any kind of physical post-stroke issue. Help with circulation. You need to let your guard down and relax. Once we start talking about post-stroke trauma, emotional trauma, we're going to talk about how much tension you can carry in your body when you're always on alert and hypervigilant, maybe for another stroke. Maybe you feel very vulnerable now, but man, do we carry that stuff in our body and that's not good for you. The next one on your ideal team is your friends and family, your people, your posse, your squad. You got to get these people, uh, you know, educated so they can give you their very best. And the final one, Please do not ever forget that the captain of your team is you. Nobody can carry this recovery like you can. You do need a lot of support, and I believe strongly that we are interconnected social beings, but the truth is, is you have to do your best to stay positive and focused on this recovery. I wouldn't be a good neuropsychologist if I did not tell you exactly what we do. Um, and then we're gonna open up to questions and answers. So really at the end of the day, what I do is I tell people exactly what's going on with their brain, make personal recommendations about what they're gonna do about it. And my goal is more independence, more quality of life, more brain health. So neuropsychologists basically do four things. And what I want you to notice is what I have in parentheses, okay? In my parentheses, I have how much face-to-face -face time we spend with patients to do that part of the evaluation, okay? So the interview, face-to-face, -face, in person or in Zoom, <laughs> is an hour. This is like all your medical history. What were your symptoms of stroke? What happened that day? How did it feel? What are all the changes you've had? Physical, cognitive, moods, so all that stuff I talked to you about before, okay? reviewing the medical records in detail. I, this might be one of the most helpful things I do as a doctor because I truly believe there's gold in medical records. Um, just recently uh, helped a family to identify that um, they had actually found something pretty significant, uh, uh, basically a mass in the person's thyroid um, because, um, pardon me, not thyroid, pancreas, um, because um, there had been so much hubbub about the stroke and what was going on that that little tiny finding kind of got buried. So we're really good. At, we're kind of detectives in that way. The information we learn in the interview informs the testing. This is paper and pencil and computer testing that help me know how are you doing in a certain area like memory when compared to other people your same age with your same education. So the pattern of how you do on my testing tells me, for example, this is a memory problem due to poor hearing or poor auditory comprehension. This is a memory problem because the person can't focus. This is a memory problem because, wow, they really have a learning problem. 
this is a memory problem because they can't make new memories. There's all sorts of explanations for cognitive issues and the testing helps me break all that down. That's two to four hours. Then we do the feedback. The best part of being a neuropsychologist is the feedback because that's when I get to say, here's what I know. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to do, okay? So that is four, five, six, six hours just focused on you. I ask you what other brain health specialist gets to know you that well. Okay, we then put it all together in a report that's very detailed, it's integrated, it goes back to your team, you can get a copy and that is your map. So if you haven't seen a neuropsychologist, um, you can write to us, I will help you find a board certified person in your area. Um, I really encourage you, most insurance companies will cover it. If you have not done that, please, please, please give yourself the gift of a neuropsych evaluation. So remember, your map is here to help you set goals and keep your eye on the prize. It helps you set those small attainable positive goals in each area of function that you need in order to do your recovery. If you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do, right? Once you have goals and you know what to do, then your job becomes turning it into something that is rewarding and maybe actually even enjoyable or fun. You know, saying that you will do it as opposed to you won't do it. Like, you know, instead of, um, you know, well, uh, let's see, uh, I'm having, you know, my blood sugar is really, really high. So, you know, I'm not going to eat any more chocolate chip cookies. Well, that is actually kind of a negative. We know this in the world of motivational psychology. What would be better is if you can say, you know, I'm really going to start to um, have an apple a day to try to manage that sweet tooth. So the more proactive and positive you can make it, the more likely you are to follow through. Next one is using a buddy system. I hope a lot of you have at least one solid person in your life that you can ask them for encouragement, support, see if they'll go out and do some of the rehab recovery things with you side by side. This map is here to really guide you, inspire you, keep you on course. And what I really want you to do is kind of change your mindset instead of kind of waiting for these big signs of recovery. The way stroke recovery really happens is brick by brick by brick. If you don't attune your mindset to what I call the micro victories, what I'm afraid of is that you're going to get discouraged and you're not going to think you're getting better. If you do what I tell you to do in these 10 sessions, I guarantee you, you will be better on the other end than when you came in. But what I want you to do is reinforce yourself by celebrating even the smallest improvement and rewarding yourself for your hard work. Rehab and recovery of a stroke is a big, big, big deal. You have to keep it going by feeling like you're getting out of it what you're putting into it, okay? So I want you to ask yourself now and when our time is done, are there areas in my life where I haven't yet validated myself as being impacted by my stroke? And where do I need to seek more care? This is what you're going to write in your new stroke recovery journal, okay? And every time we meet, we're going to end with a self-empowerment statement where I want to try to change your thinking for the better based on my rules. So after we've gone through this awesome hour and 20 minutes together where I really hope you felt understood and validated and motivated, I want you to say this to yourself. I deserve a treatment plan that addresses all of my symptoms, not just the physical, not just what other people can see, okay? So I deserve a treatment plan that addresses all of my symptoms. Now we're gonna switch over to talking and interacting. I love this part, oh my goodness, I have been yapping. So I'm going to go to the question and answer um, section and my good buddy Jerry has a question waiting for me and uh, I am going to do my best to read it and then answer it. Okay, Jerry says, for myself, my family, and all my stroke friends and community, knowledge is key, and I need to learn all I can from you. Man, Jerry, that is the best attitude, and I want you all to be inspired by Jerry. That's the mindset is of a student. You didn't necessarily know about stroke when you came into this thing. Within an instant, all of a sudden, you are a stroke survivor, okay? you have a lot to learn. And again, why I'm here is I frankly was pretty disappointed in the insurance-based medical system when I understood what was involved with stroke recovery. It's really not good enough. And the only person that's going to bring that information into your brain is you and your caregivers. Okay. So the more you learn, I truly believe the more you will recover. 
Okay. Uh, Miss Hassan is asking me, uh, her mom got an ischemic stroke in November 2019, which led to weakness on the right side of the body, uh, which is really difficult for her to maintain any mobility. Yeah, that's really tough. Uh, I guess one thought is when you do get symptoms on a whole side of your body, that really means one of two things. So one is it's a relatively big stroke. Um, because we're seeing, you know, fully all the way down from, you know, the arm all the way down to the leg. Um, but also there are typically other symptoms. So when a stroke is that significant, again, it's so easy to focus on the physical, but I would also imagine that your mom uh, probably is struggling with some other things too that just aren't seen. And sometimes when we've had a stroke, it's hard for us to be the best observer of our behavior. So one thought is that if you have the option of seeing a neuropsychologist, it could probably help her to really understand the total impact of the stroke. So she says, uh, what should be the top three things that would expedite her recovery? Oh my goodness, that's a great question. And any specific foods or fruits. Oh, I love this. Okay, I'm going to do the second question first. So foods or fruits. Um, the goal is anti-inflammatory. So remember what we talked about at the beginning, blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. All brain cells want is oxygen and glucose. And if they don't get it, they're going to not have their fuel and they're going to die, right? Anything you can do to open the blood vessels. This is exercise. This is what you eat, right? With eating, the key is to reduce processed foods. Anything that comes from a box is basically junk food, okay? I know a lot of us have been trained to think that crackers are health food, believe me. I used to love a good Triscuit. Um, it's a lot of rancid oil and it's frankly too much sugar. So the more uh, original, you can eat your foods, right? So the more the way nature, God made it, that's really the best for the brain. You also really want to incorporate high quality fats. So like avocado, fish oil, um, what did I just have? Oh, you know, good, good organic nuts, raw nuts that haven't necessarily been roasted. Within fruits, um, what's interesting is that what they teach us for brain health is to eat the rainbow. You really want to have a lot of, the best ones are probably like the darker purple and red. So cherries, pomegranates are really high up there. Of course, blueberries have a lot of good research. But you know, even sometimes I feel like nutrition, um, some people almost over-focus on that, to be honest. Most people have a lot of work to do to improve their diet. But to tell you the truth, what I really think is the ultimate Thing for uh, blood flow and brain health is really moving your body more. Now, of course, that's hard if you have hemiparesis on one side, but we want to just, you know, encourage her with her good side to just simple chair exercises. Uh, one of my big favorite things to tell people is even if you're sitting there and you're watching TV um, and you don't feel like doing anything, every commercial, you know, as much as you can move the parts of your body that are working well, that requires your heart to beat harder and you're going to get more of an opening in those blood vessels. So I think movement research suggests that that's actually the very, very best thing that you can do to try to um, get more blood and oxygen to the brain. Now, that being said, um, in terms of your really specific question, which how does she get back the function of her right side, that really comes into play when we get into the rule about repetition and consistency. So I hope you'll be with us for that one, because the way physical rehab is really taught is it's much, much, much too little. If you look at the animal literature on how do animals recover the use of a paw um, after a, a sham stroke, the recovery is much better because they put these animals through incredible repetition. There's a lot of um, uh, push right now for something called mast practice in rehab, which is going to be dramatically increasing the number of repetitions that we offer to people in recovery. So I hope you'll join us for that one. Um, okay, let me see here. I wish I was fancy enough to be able to actually chat with you guys. Let me see how I can do that one a little bit better. Okay, well, you know what, if anybody else wants to type in, let me see that. Okay, if anybody wants to um, type in any questions, that's probably the best way. And then uh, once I get a little more fancy with this stuff, oh, my friend Joe, Joe, what do you have to say? It's Joe Francis in Pennsylvania, my dear, how are you? Okay, raised hands, yes, Carrie's trying to help me. Oh, chat, ooh, yeah, 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 I'm figuring this out. 
Oh, awesome. Okay. I just helped myself. Okay, raised hands. Carrie is helping me. Okay, Miss Joe, as a caregiver to a locked in husband, let me just pause and explain what that means. So Joe's darling husband unfortunately had a very serious stroke in uh, the back part of his brain that makes him have locked in syndrome. Locked in syndrome is extremely distressing to the person and to their loved ones because the idea is that they are completely paralyzed for the most part with the exception of eye movements. Um, Joe's husband's definitely been making miracle strides and getting a little bit of hand use back and, and mouth use. But the idea is the person is awake and conscious and cognitively intact. They just are basically trapped in their body, which is uh, extremely painful to imagine. Uh, she's read as many books she can on his stroke. Uh, his stroke was caused by an accident at work. Oh man, that's so happens so bad. Which way should I go? Well, Joe, we've talked, so you know what I think about your situation is I am desperate to try to get your husband into a new rehab program. So yes, he had his stroke years ago, but he was locked in for a certain amount of time. And then through all your good loving care, he's had this amazing spurt of recovery. But if we don't take advantage of that time and get him to a rehab program where they can personalize his care, either teaching him how to use a communication board more effectively, or really trying to uh, get in there and exploit this recovery and get more out of it. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid he's not going to get as good as he possibly can. Now, what screws all this up is COVID, right? So, you know, I've tried to make some calls for you. And unfortunately, it was so frustrating to not hear back, which I always interpret as, man, here I am calling as Dr. Sullivan, you know, could I, could I please get a call back? And, you know, I don't get a call back. It just makes me really have my heart broken for those of you who are trying to uh, be the mastermind between you or a loved one's recovery. So I, I feel you. Um, you know, I would say, Joe, just please keep trying to get him into that rehab. And, you know, all the things we talked about too, like personalizing what you do for him. That's actually, I think it's rule three, which is how to bring more of you and your unique um, life into your recovery. That's so, so, so important. So I know we've talked about like, what did your husband like before? You know, even if it's just YouTube videos in front of him of fishing or car racing, just something to kind of get those networks that have been in his brain his whole life reactivated, re-engaged. That's just kind of gives a little bit, I think of it like fertilizer in a garden, just kind of helps the brain get a little bit more pumped up. And then, you know, pay attention to where he's at now with his communication. And instead of, you know, trying to imagine, wow, here's the end goal and that's where I want him to be. Think about more like what's the very next step that would be in the right direction. Okay. So for example, I know I saw a video where he was doing like a thumbs up. Really try to focus on that. Try to have him do that as many times in a day as you can. And then the more he gets a little bit fluent with that, you know, maybe start to talk about, could we do a thumbs down? You know, maybe it's even moving it this much, right? That's what I mean by micro victories. We can't just wait for someone to one day be able to go like this, right? That's not gonna happen. The way the brain recovers is small, little incremental recoveries. And so what I want you to do is to really kind of attune your brain uh, to exactly what it is that your husband would be able to do. Okay, let me see another great question here. Oh, I love this one from you, Stephen. He said, I had a cerebellar pons and midbrain strokes. I'm in an area where some of these specialties aren't available. What can I do to help myself? Man, that really gets me right here because I know I keep saying like, this is the reason why I wanna do this, but this really is another one of the reasons. Uh, that, that hurts me to know that you might not have access to specialists. I have two thoughts. One is because of COVID, one really positive uptick we're seeing is more telehealth. So for example, like right now, I used to just be able to see people through, uh, who are in North Carolina, United States, because that's where my license is. But now I think there's 14 states where I can actually do telehealth legally over Zoom. So perhaps go back to your neurologist or your primary care and ask them if they know someone who is doing telehealth for your issue and maybe try that um, avenue. The other thing is you're already doing it, which is being in this stroke recovery group. I really did design this thinking of my people out there who might be on like a remote island who don't even have a neurologist. I've heard from many people in all parts of the world, uh, 
between the Philippines and you know, places in South America where they've never seen a doctor for their stroke. And so I always try to think, okay, you know, that's the ideal if you have a stroke team, but what if you don't? And so that's why when we go through these 10 rules of rehab, Stephen, it basically it's, it's what can you do for yourself uh, knowing what the experts know. Now, you know, of course they have expertise that you don't, but for me, at least if you know these 10 rules, you at least have a chance. That's kind of the way that I think about it. So I hope you'll stick with us uh, for the 10 sessions. The first one today is really kind of an orientation um, so we can figure out um, exactly how it is we're gonna work this group together. Okay, um, so it's 5.30. I know you guys have busy, important lives. I don't wanna keep you from doing anything, but truly, I loved being here tonight. This is a dream come true. This is exactly the type of personalized brain health care that I think you all deserve. And the fact that you've all welcomed me into your homes and into your life means so much to me. And I will do my very best to uh, live up to your expectations. So thank you all so much. Within an, uh, 24 hours, Carrie will be sending you a copy of this so you can watch it again. You'll be getting your interactive handouts. And what I really, really, really hope is that all of you who are with us tonight are going to be back with us uh, when we meet again next Thursday. So we will be back together September 24th. And rule number two is build on what's familiar. Remember the essence of recovery is to rebuild brain networks. So what does this really mean? This is that personalized piece that I was talking about. If I say, you know, you need to learn how to speak better, well, guess what? That's very generic. So I have a series of exercises we're gonna do together where for every symptom, we're gonna think through what was familiar to that person before? Because remember, that's how their brain is organized. Every brain is different. So what's gonna work for me isn't necessarily, Joe, what's gonna work for your husband, right? So I want us to do some reflecting on, we're gonna go through childhood, teenage, young adult, adult. There is jewels and gems in your life history to help you push this recovery forward. But again, you don't know what you don't know. And so we're really gonna focus on that in rule two. If you're not registered, there are a couple spots left. You can go to the website listed here below and get yourself a spot. Um, I am again, so pleased to have been with you tonight. I hope you feel like it was worthwhile. You learned, you are motivated and inspired. So I will see you all again next Thursday at four o'clock, same exact way that we did it tonight. Thank you guys so much and please take good care.